Welcome to this video lecture on multi-factor experiments. Multi-factor experiments, as the name suggests, are experiments where many factors are explored in a single experiment. Now, if we have many factors, and each of those factors is at many levels, that will give rise to a large experiment. And it may be prohibitively large. This could give rise to an experiment that's so big that it's simply too expensive or takes too long to carry out the experiment. So we will spend a lot of our time in this section looking at strategies to reduce the size of multi-factor experiments. It's a good idea to carry out multi-factor experiments. We can investigate the effect of multiple factors on the response. We can also investigate interactions between the factors. But we need the experiment to be small enough in size that it's possible for us to carry out the experiment. So we'll now look at some of those strategies. Our first strategy is to only consider two levels of every factor. So even though a factor may have many levels, in the experiment we will only consider two levels. We will call those levels high and low, or plus one and minus one. So instead of looking at multiple levels of every factor, we consider just two levels. So if we have k factors, each at two levels, this will give two to the power of k runs, not counting replication. We will still need some replicates. The effect of a factor is the difference between the average response at its high level and its average response at low level. This is something of a change in language from what we use in two-factor experiments. Previously, we used the word effect to describe the difference between the average response at a certain factor level and the grand average response. We don't use that language in the context of multi-factor experiments. Comparing the average response at, a, at the high level of a factor with the average response, we now call that the coefficient. And we use the word effect to denote the difference between high and low. Now, every time we take a shortcut, we incur some danger. And we have just introduced a shortcut into our experiment by restricting the number of levels that we're exploring to just two levels. So this gives rise to the situation that we won't be able to detect curvature. Suppose, for example, we're carrying out an experiment with paper airplanes. And one of the factors is the angle at which the paper airplane is thrown, the initial angle of the flight path, the angle it makes with the horizontal. It could be the case that a 45 degree angle is optimum and smaller angles and larger angles will fall away in the curve pattern shown there. Now, if we explored many levels, there's 10 levels, we could easily see that there is curvature present in the design space. But if we only look at two levels, it's simply not possible to see curvature. Two points cannot describe a curve. With two points, we'll either think that there is no effect at all due to angle, or we will think that there is a linear effect. So we need to do something to address this loss of information. The two levels is incapable of illustrating curvature. We get around this by including a center point in the design. So here I have represented by the corners of a cube the design space for a three-factor experiment where we're exploring the effect of the length and width and air temperature when throwing a paper airplane. We're exploring the effect of these on how far the paper airplane travels. So the length is shown there but having levels 20 and 30 is the low and high levels. The width has levels 8 and 12 centimeters for the low and high levels. And the air temperature has levels 15 and 25 degrees for the low and high levels. Now there could be curvature in any one of those factors. And with only two levels, it's going to be impossible to see that curvature. However, if we add one design point, and you notice the point I've placed in the center of the cube, that design point where the length is halfway between high and low, the width is halfway between high and low, and the temperature is halfway between high and low. If there is no curvature in any of these factors, then the response at the center point will not differ significantly from the average response at all of the corners of the cube. So we add a single center point and that allows us to detect for curvature. 
So it will give us a center point p-value or a curvature p-value. So we can test the hypothesis that there is no curvature in the design space. And then if that's the case, we can go ahead then and interpret the other p-values without worrying whether curvature may be present. So as we just said, all facts are set halfway between high and low. And there's a null hypothesis that there's no curvature. If we have a text factor, of course, it's not possible to have a center point. Suppose one of the factors in our experiment is the person who throws the paper airplane. One person is called Sean, the other person is called Ben. Now, there is no halfway between Sean and Ben because those are text levels. Where we have numbers, we can easily identify a center point or a halfway point. But with uh, a text factor, there is no halfway. So the only way to proceed there is to duplicate the center point. So we might have length and width and temperature and also person. So both Sean and Ben must throw a paper airplane which is set halfway between the high and low settings for all of the numeric factors. Our second strategy for reducing the size of a multi-factor experiment is to perform only a fraction of the experiment. We perform only one half of the runs or one quarter or one eighth. Here we have uh, an illustration of a paper airplane experiment where we're exploring length and width and temperature as the three factors. This time I have shown the levels in coded units. I've shown them as minus one and plus one as the low and high levels of length, width and temperature rather than the uncoded units, which I've shown previously. Uh, coded units have advantages for analysis, but uncoded units are much simpler to talk about because the numbers are recognized by the client who is familiar with the levels of the factors. Now, there are eight design points on the cube. So if every factor level combination is explored, then there is a design point at every one of the eight corners of this cube. But you will notice that I have highlighted four corners of the cube with uh, heavy circles. Those four corners represent a half fraction. So only half the design points are going to be explored. You will also notice that it's a very well balanced fraction. Two of those points are for long paper airplanes and two are for short. Two are for wide and two are for narrow. Two are for hot air and two are for cold air. And not only that, but of the two that are in hot air, one is wide, one is narrow, one is long, one is short. So the experiment is perfectly balanced. We say that this is an orthogonal set. So the design is balanced. Some information, however, is missing. For example, if we exclude the point which is a long and hot and wide paper airplane, then if there's a three-way interaction, we will simply never discover that there is something special happening at that design point because we never explore it. So information about certain interactions will be missing. And something even more subtle than this, some effects will be mixed up with other effects. For example, if there is a length width interaction such that a paper airplane should be well proportioned in order to travel a long distance. That is, its length and width should both be high or should both be low. Well then, if we look at the fractional design that we showed in the previous slide, when the length and width match, then we find that it's cold air. The length and width match at the bottom right rear corner or the front left uh, bottom corner. That's where the length and width are the same, but both of those are in cold air. Whereas the two design points where the length and width have a mismatch are both at the top of this cube. They're both in hot air. The uh, front right top corner and the back left top corner are both situations where the length and width have different levels, but it's also the place where the temperature is high. So we have mixed up the effect of length with interaction with temperature. That's called confounding or aliasing. So when we perform a fractional factorial experiment, some information is missing, completely missing, and other information gets mixed up. So 
the effects of different interactions get mixed up with each other and with main effects. The good thing is that we can look at the alias structure before we begin or after we've performed the experiment. And the alias structure tells us what is confounded with what. Any terms that are written on the same line are confounded with each other. For example, we see A minus BC. So the main effect of A is confounded with the BC interaction. So if we get a significant p-value for the factor A, then we can be aware that either A is having an effect on the response or the BC interaction is having an effect on the response. So it allows us to explore the possible interpretations based on the alias structure. Our third strategy for reducing the size of experiments is to carry out an experiment without replication. And this is based on the sparsity principle. If we have an experiment with a large number of factors, it's probably the case that most of those factors are having no effect on the response. That's the sparsity principle. Most of the factors do not have an effect and the significant factors are sparse. If that's the case, then what appears to be the effect of these non-significant factors is basically just more random variation. So if we draw a plot of the effects of all the factors, a lot of them will seem trivial and the significant factors will stand out in such a plot. So important factors will stand out from the crowd because the crowd consists of the many factors which are not having an effect. And so a plot looks like this. Now, if you have replication, this is also a very useful plot, a Pareto chart of the effects. Uh, we plot the effect of different factors. And here we have six different factors in an experiment. When we perform the plot, one factor, D, which is the person who throws the paper airplane, stands out from the crowd. And if we also have replication, we can calculate a p-value. And so that red dotted vertical line shows where the effects where, where the uh, factors have a p-value that is less than the threshold significance value. You might notice that we're using an alpha value of 1% rather than 5% in this experiment. And that's because when we do a multi-factor experiment, we are testing a lot of different hypotheses. And if we're testing multiple hypotheses and testing them all at the 5% level, then there's an individual error rate of 5%. That is the probability of incorrectly rejecting a null hypothesis. The probability of a type 1 error is 5% on every occasion. And therefore, because we have many null hypotheses, the probability that there's some type 1 errors in there is greatly increased. So the family error rate is greater than the individual error rate. For that reason, when we're testing a large number of hypotheses, it's better to use a p-value smaller than 5%. So if you're testing, let's say, five or more hypotheses, it's better to use a p-value of 1% so that the family error rate is reduced. Multi-factor experiments with just two levels of every factor can be used as screening experiments, that is, to find out which factors are affecting the response. And if, during a, a multi-factor experiment, we find that there's one or two factors only out of all the candidates that are affecting the response, then we can carry out a larger experiment later where we explore these factors at many different levels. You can read more about this in the textbook in section 7c.